it's time for another one of these vlog reviews. Uh, this one took about two months, actually. What had happened was, in preparation for my Live Alive playthrough, I decided, you know what, let me clean out my collection of games. I have a lot of games that I purchased, but never bothered to finish, or even, well, one I didn't bother to start. So I finished Kingdom Hearts the remake of Chain of Memories and Reverse Rebirth. I finished some other bullshit, and I decided to give Ten Two a chance. Now, for a very long time, I didn't really know too much about Ten Two as a kid. Like when it first came out in two thousand three, I would see websites about Ten Two, but I didn't know what to make of it. I was just thinking, when's 12 going to drop? And in elementary school, around the 5th grade, a friend of mine was just name-dropping a bunch of Final Fantasies, and he mentioned 10 too. And I was like, you mean 12, right? That just came out. It didn't, by the way. It would be a couple of months until it came to the U.S. And he said, no, there was, a, there was actually a sequel to 10, a direct sequel. I'm thinking... They started telling me some of the things that happened, like some shit about Titus and Waka having a baby with Lulu and all this really interesting shit. And I'm thinking, damn, I'm a. Because that summer I was playing through 10 with my best friend at the time. And I'm, I'm thinking, oh crap, it's lit right now. So a year later when I got more into the internet, I actually looked it up and I saw the intro. A part of me died when I saw the What Can I Do For You song. It just seemed wrong. Now 10 is by no means my favorite Final Fantasy game. But it's one that... I played when I was seven and I really, really liked. Even though it was like different from the early runs, it's not open world, which I didn't like. And it had those kinds of problems, but who cares? It was still pretty good. It still tried to challenge itself, it had its own identity. But I decided, you know, I'm going to give Ten Two a chance since they got the Ten Ten Two HD remake, remaster thing. So I started playing it. And after going through it once, achieving 90% completion and a good ending, and really the last couple of weeks of that first run was dedicated just to... Fiend Arena and getting, you know, completing the tournaments, defeating Major Numerus once with Almighty Shinra and Yuna and the other time with uh, YRP. And also, I was dedicated to defeating All Might. Yeah, actually, I wasn't really that other, um, desperate on defeating Almighty Shinra. I did it in one day. I cheesed it, but I still did it. I had to complete it a second time because, well, I wanted to get the perfect ending. I wanted to get 100% completion, so I had to make some different decisions that would affect the rest of the game in Chrono Cross fashion. And that was it. And I also did last mission, but we'll get to that later. Now, graphically, again, the HD version is great. The backgrounds are really pop now. Like, if you think see things like the skyline and the sea, it looks great. The backgrounds look amazing. And the HD filters over the high polygon characters, the main characters, looks really good. The low polygon characters still look like shit. I'm just speaking in terms of looking like Ken dolls. 
freaking like they had no soul. That was a problem with some of the high polygon, I mean low polygon characters like uh, Elma, Lucille, and all these other background characters. They could still look good, but they're not. They're kind of limiting themselves in a way that's a little ugly, too. So there's that unnecessary duality going on. Learn that it looks great. I found myself not liking the CG cutscenes, no. Like, CG cutscenes are where it's supposed to look great. They break out of the in-engine graphics for a bit to show us a scene, to show us a spectacle, something to keep us glued, but I didn't really like some of the faces. Um, it might be a disgusting way of putting it, but a lot of the characters in CG look worse than they do in-game because they kind of look a little inbred, like their jawlines, their faces. I, I didn't really feel it. Yeah, it just didn't look as good, except for Yuna. Yuna still looked good regardless, except for except for the okay ending scene, the first CG cutscene for the good ending you'll get. But I really liked the in-engine graphics a little better than the CG, especially with the HD filters. You could have made the whole thing in-engine, and I would have been happier with that. I don't know why, because I never really felt this way with the first ten. I guess someone must have fucked up, or maybe it's just me. That's a cop out thing to say. That's like that's the thing people say when they're trying to avoid criticism. Maybe it's just me, but nah. This this game has a different composer. Like the first ten had Nobuo Umatsu. We know him kind of having a video game orchestral thing going on with a little bit of uh, 60s, 70s rock going on with that uh, deep purple kind of influence. And then we have Junja Takano who is more interested in instrumental tone than he is in melody which kind of makes him have really interesting tunes. Like, the way the synth has been programmed, it sounds good with him. And then there's Masashi Mazuo. I apologize because in my 13 review I said that he wasn't as good as Nabuo or Mitsuda, but no, he's... When he goes in, he goes in. Like his Saga Frontier 2 soundtrack, this guy, this guy goes hard. I've heard some of the battle themes he's composed in 10, like, when you fight Yu Yevin, that shit kicks ass. He's a beast on them sticks. On that keyboard. Classic, but with a really nice sense of melody and harmony that's creative. I wish 13... Had some of that for stuff outside of Bartendless and Steam, which is great. But I'm gonna give 13 another chance. I'm gonna try to post game in a few because 10 2 just. Because I like 10 2, I think maybe I gave 13 not enough chances, so I'm gonna try it again. Not from the beginning, but from the post game. Try to get rid of some of the super bosses and shit. What else? Yeah, but the composer here changed. The composer is Noriko Matsuda and her husband. Really, she's the focus. Her husband is kind of the afterthought. Now, her influence is primarily jazz. She does do some of the pseudo-orchestral video game music, but... 
couple of guitar, you know, jazz fusion. You gotta have some rock influence. But no, her stuff is really jazzy, which you can tell when you beat a boss or win a battle. The victory fanfare theme isn't that typical jingle you get. Nope, you get some weird jazz fusion number. Which I used to really like jazz fusion, so especially for video games. Is it Final Fantasy like? On paper, no, and sometimes it doesn't really match. But that one thousand words song she wrote really did justice and some of the battle themes towards the end game and boss themes and things of that nature. And kind of the main theme to get an intro. The intro to this game is what glued me in. This game had a really good intro before you press pause. Very solemn. Very thought provoking in a way. And you hear that a couple of times. So this soundtrack here is actually really good. And I know her for Bahama Lagoon and working with Umatsu to design the boss team for Chrono Trigger. So I know her style. I know she's versatile. It's too bad she retired after this, but like how could you follow up? So the soundtrack is really good. Is it as good as the original ten? I would say no, but it has its moments where it is a little better than the soundtrack. Ten is not the best soundtrack for any Final Fantasy game, but still. It's it's a thing of situation at the moment. Battle system I will criticize though, which is the most important thing right now. Battle system here, before I get to the story and everything, is it's it's good good shitty, but still kind of shitty by my standards. Because while I like the dress fear system, I love the strategy associated with that. The battles are really easy. The battles are so easy because there's one thing where you just hold the controller with one hand and just keep hammering the confirm button. You could just hold the confirm button and win most of the battles here. It is so easy to be overpowered and main game enemies never really stand a chance. You kind of have to go for super bosses in order to have some challenge. And usually when you get to them, they're so uncharacteristically challenging that you actually have to cheese them a little bit. But thankfully, because this is like Final Fantasy 3 and 5, cheesing isn't all that hard. Or tactics, for that matter. Now, you change your jobs mid uh in mid battle with a dress fear system which is pretty cool actually and there's a lot of good dress fears like a uh, samurai you have physical attackers magic users you have a pretty wide arsenal of things you can use and they got pretty creative. They got the mascot dress for you, a gun mage, a gunner. Like, you would see some of the typical stuff, like a white mage, black mage, thief, warrior. But, they got some interesting shit. It opens up so many opportunities for future Final Fantasy-esque game designs. They brought back the ATB from 10, which I... Which I like because they brought it back, but they made it new again by making it really fast and having it so that you can at your your characters can attack with each other and can with chain attacks and stun enemies so you can keep attacking them, not getting them a chance to attack, or you can get attacked the same time your enemy attacks another dude. So things are fast. In fact, they throw most people off. In the beginning, I know it kind of threw me off, but 
once you figure it out, you can just hold the confirm button and you don't even have to let go of the thing once and most of the battles will be over and done with. Yeah, that kind of fucks things up for you. I didn't really like that, but on paper, everything was on point. And they brought back the leveling up system. Because that actually made things less grindy. I wasn't busy playing with a sphere grid or a crystarium or doing anything unnecessary. I just fought until I was at a desired level. And that was it. Now, I know that 13.2 did the same thing for the original 13. They kind of brought back the leveling system. No, they did, actually. So that was that's good, too. I burped, sorry. But that was... All that said, that was actually pretty good. That they brought back the leveling up system. It made things a lot less headache-inducing. Because I know how annoying grinding was in the original 10. And that was panic attack inducing uh, since this is the international version they added fiend arena which is where you capture monsters get their bios every time you level up complete a chapter or win a tournament at a tournament they had a separate beast theory there's a normal beast theory and there's one for the fiend arena and that was I was pretty smart of them to do all that stuff because that adds a lot of replay value. And it makes things a lot easier to do in one playthrough. Getting a mascot and getting all sorts of stuff. That was all good and well. They had a festival dress sphere too. That's that. What else did they add for international version? Pretty sure you added something else. Whatever, so that's the battle system. Battle system is an improvement. De definitely in some regards. But I'd say it's it improves everything, but it ultimately fucks up. It's worse because we could just hold up the confirm button and win all the battles. Battles are too easy, there's no sense of balance. They're either too easy or on a post game, they're nearly impossible unless you cheese it. Which you will cheese. Okay. Oh yeah. You can actually use those fiends in battle. You can set them in your party now, so you're not just stuck with YRP in this version of the game. You actually can use characters from the original 10 if you capture them. You can use monsters. Oh, you could use uh, super bosses too. You can put them in your party. Depending on their height, they occupy like one, two, or three slots in, in the field. So a mid-sized character, you can only have a, a small character to accompany it. And that kind of opens up for a new strategy it also kind of fucks things up because they're on autopilots they might do stupid things unless you unequip them of certain abilities you could also develop them a different way by feeding them items to directly boost their stats instead of having to level up so you can potentially turn any character into a beast if you have the patience for it but that's for that now for a storyline, to wrap this part of my review up, it is a direct sequel, so it's going to have a storyline that's going to be a bit of a change in tone. This one was ridiculously and heartbreakingly goofy, but at times it was also pretty epic, too. There was some sense of emotion and tension going on. But overall, it's goofy character. Like, uh, all the characters are goofier now. You do have Pain, who's kind of like the tough, edgy girl. 
angsty chick, but it's kind of predictable in that she's a tough angsty chick, but over time she opens herself up and she's really fun and cool. Everything about this is goofier than the last one, and the plot is completely reactionary to the last one. It's about bringing Titus back, essentially. And there's a new bad guy in the midst. But I don't like those reactionary storylines because, hold up, let me, let me actually leave the room. Final Fantasy, good, big theme of the games is, uh, death, accepting death, and while Titus didn't die, he disappeared, which in many ways could be a fate worse than death, the dream vanished, and bringing Titus back kind of takes out that consequence, but that's a common criticism, which I could get past if it goes about it with a sense of maturity. Which, it really didn't, but nonetheless, I was really happy when Titus came back. But it also gets me to wondering. What would happen if future Final Fantasy Direct sequels are like this, where the plot is about taking out all the sadness and tragedies of the last one title? That would... That would open up a slippery slope for crap, which is not just me being paranoid or making a fallacy. It kind of happened with the 13 Lightning Trilogy. I mean, did you see how fairy tale like the end of Lightning Returns is? It's really crazy. And of course, that, that's also well deserved because Lightning Return. The Lightning Trilogy just had a string of bittersweet endings. Horrible in 13 too, by the way. But I don't really like this aspect of the story. and Still felt really happy when Titus came back. I forgot how much I liked Titus. Just seeing his face. like A lot of people hate him because he was annoying. But my whole experience in... Playing 10, I actually kind of felt sorry for him for a situation. Kind of being seen as the weird outsider from another world and not a lot of people believe him. And having to realize all these things about Yuna and what her pilgrimage really is for and how the ending will be. Now, a lot of that stuff is fucked up. Finding out your dream will vanish as soon as you save the world. That, that's heavy shit. But nonetheless, it's, that was 10 for you, so I really liked Titus, I liked how goofy it is, how emo he is, even like his look a little bit, I like Titus, man, that's a cool character, maybe I like him so much because he's a normal dude compared to Cecil, Terra, Cloud, or Squall, he's He's not really a fighter, he's a, an athlete. Which is still not extraordinary, but... I mean, not completely ordinary, but still. He's not some badass, earthly warrior. But that's enough with talking about the storyline. You'll find that in the beginning, the story is kind of shitty, but towards the end, it'll get good, because... There's not so much of a plot in the first two chapters. Except for the last ending of chapter two. Most of it is like this cheesy rivalry where you're getting dress fears or fucking up with your team rocket rivals. And then when it starts to focus on the antagonist, then it starts to get interesting. But let's move on to the roguelike which is last mission as it turns out for this collection you don't have to get the perfect ending to get all the scenes for last mission it implies it so you can 
get right into it as soon as you have the disc and have the game ready. The last mission is roguelike where you climb a tower called Utier's Tower. I think it's Utier. They, they, they said the name of the tower once. But it's this 84 tower. Every five floors, there's a barrier to the elevator that'll take you one story up. And a 10th floor, 10th, 20th, 30th, 40th, 50th, 60th, 70th, 80th, you will get a cutscene. And a random treasure. You'll get this treasure every time you go to this floor. And then... Every 20th floor, 20th, 40th, 60th, and ultimately 80th, there's a boss. They're never really hard, because you'll be over-leveled, but there's bosses. Every floor is randomly generated, the enemies are fixed, but the items are random. And the structure of the floor is random. But that's pretty much it. Uh, it's turn based every time you take a step, use an item, attack, pass a turn, you skip a turn, and your enemies get a turn too. Once they get their turn, you get your turn back. You move step by step, trying to fight these guys in the beginning. It's very tough in typical roguelike fashion because the enemies are so strong. But once you do all of that, it's pretty simple. This is the second roguelike I've ever played. The first one is Pokemon Mystery Dungeon. But I like this one because it sticks with the 10-2 vibe. And actually, I'd like the storyline in this one because it's a very simple storyline. It's a storyline about friends growing apart. It is perfect for roguelike, actually. Roguelikes need simple storylines that are relatable. Especially if you're going into towers, doing hood rat things with your friends. But that's besides the point. The inventory is short, which is the most difficult thing about this title. And there are traps everywhere, which is the most annoying thing. That's why I get to have to always be ready to save. But in, uh, you layer on dress spheres to get their abilities. There's only going to be one dress fear that you actually wear, which is the first one you equip. You can switch the first one, but pretty much it's the first one, and everything else is a layering, which is just for passive abilities and not for actual stack gains or direct shit. So, you could challenge yourself by limiting how many you have, but other than that, it's a pretty neat system and you can do just about anything and get yourself really powerful. So I really like this one. It uses recycle the soundtracks and enemies are all re recycled. The polygons have a different length though. I notice that much. And unlike any of the earlier Final Fantasy entries, you have a fully rotatable camera. Which you didn't have for 10 or 10 too. You can use the camera, the right analog stick, just turn the camera anywhere you please. That's badass. Yeah, I think the roguelike game was even better than 10 and 10 too, if I think about it. 80 floors. I was gonna do it in 8 play sessions, I ended up doing it in. Five play sessions. So I'm glad I did that because when I finished that, I effectively finished a disc and now I can make my review. I don't have to touch that shit no more. Anyways, it's been your boy Mr. Wonka7 back again with another review. I don't think I'll be reviewing any Final Fantasies anytime soon or Square Enix games for that matter because. I got like a big backlog of things I'd rather do now. And probably won't be reviewing any unless I get my hands on tactics.
which would be in the very distant future because I had that sale back in March. But anyway, peace out, motherfuckers. Hope you enjoyed this shit. And I'll say I'm a yikte. Real hood